In uh, today's uh, conversation, Canadian business owner conversation, we have Ed uh, Peterson. Uh, uh, it's great to uh, have you with us, Ed Peterson. Welcome to the conversation. Thanks, Rashid. Um, yes, so I am the uh, founder and director of the Tiny Town Association. And uh, Tiny Town Association is a federally incorporated not for profit. We're working to develop affordable housing um, in the form of tiny home communities, um, initially here in Ontario, and eventually we want to see this happen across Canada. That, that, that's great. And I, uh, for folks listening, um, uh, we, uh, Ed and I met at, uh, at before at, at, at tiny home shows in Ancaster, in, uh, in Hamilton. We uh, had a chance to go over some of the great work that they have done, which we will go a bit uh, and uh, dive into it in some uh, in this conversation series. Uh, the uh, the the passion that Ed uh, and his team has is to to bring uh, practical solutions to uh, to to a real problem that most of us. Uh, living in Canada now have is the concept of how to have uh, affordable housing, uh, specifically in the modular and tiny home concept. So if you can tell us a bit more about the background of this uh, movement that you've started and uh, what is uh, what was it like then and what is it like now? Like If you can just give us a recap of uh, back then to today. Sure. Um... Well, I started in this because I really saw a need for affordable housing. Um, having three um, kids that were growing up and, and looking to, you know, move into uh, get their first homes. Um, I could see the difficulty they were having in trying to find something that they could afford, um, as well as just finding something available. I mean, both those are, are very high um, on the needs. So I came, had come across tiny homes uh, a little while, while before this, and I was looking at it as a business opportunity. Have a, I'm an entrepreneur, have been in business of my own since 83, um, and a wide range of businesses. But anyway, you know, I came across tiny homes and I thought, oh, okay, first of all, I thought this would make a good next business for myself, um, tiny home manufacturing. Um, but then I realized that the, the big obstacle was, was where people could live in tiny homes. And so even as I watched the industry kind of grow, I realized that where to live tiny was still the big obstacle as it is today. Um, so I, I informed the, the association in 2017 with a focus first of advocating for tiny homes and tiny home communities. And now in 2017 or 2023, sorry, um, we're moving into developing tiny home communities. And interesting because when I started in 2017, when I talked to municipalities or cities or towns, nobody would, nobody acknowledged the housing crisis at the time. It was kind of like if I brought up housing crisis or housing needs or everything, everybody's kind of went quiet, sort of heads went down and nobody would talk afterwards. So in, you know, the pandemic, I think really, um, really brought this issue to the forefront. And since 2020, everybody is talking about housing issues, not that they're new. I mean, they've been around for years and growing, but, you know, people are acknowledging that. And I think that's great because that's the first step in addressing an issue is you have to acknowledge you have an issue. So we're there. So 2023 here has been just super exciting. A lot more is happening in the space and um, really expecting to see big things happening next year. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And and uh, it is uh, important to see the 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 amount of work that you put in and the patience in coming all the, along since 2017 till now and uh, uh, in explaining the concept and, and helping different layers of government uh, uh, and authorities uh, uh, to to put some light on this reality and there's also the opportunity that the opportunities literally at, uh, at our backyards. Literally, it's in the in the pockets of our neighborhoods. We don't need to go to the moon to find a solution for it. Yes, yes, and that's really a big thing. Is 
you know, there's um, one of the things, of course, has been like, where do you put your, your tiny home community? And tiny home community is more of a challenge because we're looking at a number of homes on, on a property. But um, as far as creating more affordable housing, yes, um, like as you said, in your backyard, there's the opportunity there. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of people or, or homes with large lots that are underutilized and a tiny home brought in as an ADU or a granny suite or a carriage house, they call it a bunch of different things, um, you know, is a way of bringing um, more housing right in the, in, in the center of, of a city or town. And that's really exciting. It is. It is, and uh, we see that it, uh, in the past few years, the, the the construction side or the manufacturing side of uh, homes for modular has also evolved, and it's becoming more uh, uh, more streamlined and more accessible as well. What is your uh, experience on that? Uh, on on uh, comparing uh, using modular uh, uh, or prefab built homes versus uh, regular construction, which we know, especially since pandemic, especially as we speak in 2022, the cost of construction, labor shortage, and all those other uh, factors has made it almost impossible to uh, uh, to make uh, affordable projects that uh, happen. Yes. Um, well, the our, our traditional building system um, you know, is, is a one at a time system. I mean, unless you're talking about high density housing apartments or condos, towers, um, where, and again, they're not fast either because they're, they're big and complex, but you know, for a traditional house, um, where it's built on site, it's a slow process because you're basically, you know, building one, two or three houses in, in a neighborhood at a time. And, um, First of all, you know, you're, you're faced with weather issues, obviously, you know, snow, wind, you know, ice, everything slows down, rain slows down construction on site. Um, your materials are, are affected by the temperature and, and the weather. Um, so modular has that benefit of being able to produce year round 24 seven in a controlled environment. You know, your materials can be in a controlled environment as well. So it has the potential to be able to um, produce housing of the same quality as site built, but yet in, in a in a faster and uh, in with reduced cost because um, modular has the opportunity to to um, or factory built to sort of simplify the production process in that. Um, you know, you can set up a, a, a standard design. So, and I kind of relate it to um, like a condo or, or, you know, apartment where you have all the units are, are very similar. They can look different on the outside with just some, some different finishes, um, but they can be manufactured very efficiently this way. And that helps bring costs down and increase production. I was at, um, I went to 12 neighbors um, in Fredericton so that's a tiny home community um, in Nova Scotia, or yeah, New in Fredericton, New Brunswick, um, and uh, they're actually manufacturing their own homes. These are small homes um, for their community. I think they're they're expected to hit ninety nine this year, which is their their target for tiny homes in the community, and um, they're producing one home a week. So that's with a crew of seven, they're able to put out one complete home finished per week, which means, you know, that's that's 52 homes in, out produced in a year out of their production facility. So, you know, that's really exciting because, it, first of all, it's a small footprint, which means it can be, you know, they can be completed in a short period of time. But the fact that they can actually put it out and have somebody new living in a home every week is really exciting because you can't do that in any traditional build. This is very uh, good news. And I, I hope this will roll out across Canada in different provinces and different cities so we can have uh, a redundancy of suppliers. We have to, uh, so multiple sources uh, to, to, to be able to uh, increase the input. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. And then we can increase the output by as the uh, the result of it, because right now uh, I heard that sometimes when people are looking to get uh, the modular homes, there is a long wait list. 
in yes. some places, especially in Ontario. They, they have to pre-order, wait almost a year or so just to get theirs uh, done and then go through the other steps as well. Uh, do you think that uh, um, we are uh, closer to reality that we will witness these kind of uh, instant manufacturing almost within a week more often across Canada, or is it uh, some timeline before it happens? Um, well, I know that a lot of the modular companies are, are really gearing up, and there's some new um, some new companies in the industry that are bringing new technologies to to try and address that. Um, but I think um, you know a factory can only put out so many homes at a time or or any on any timeline. Honestly, what I've thought is what we really need is we need multiple factories to be able to meet demand. I mean, you know. The Ontario government and CMHC has projected we need one point, I think CMHC may have brought it down, 1.45 million homes by 2030. So if you look at that between now and 2030, there's not a whole lot. That's only six years. Yeah. So if you take six years and even if a factory can now, now this is, I should clarify because I actually had put in one of my blog posts uh, um, an apology because I had thought that that 1.5 million homes was what was needed. And, you know, we were building X number of homes per year. So that was helping address that. But I actually found out that the 1.5 or 1.45 million homes is needed in addition to our current manufacturing or building of homes being sustained at, I think, the 2022 level. So even if 2022, which was a, a, a great year for building, if that volume of new housing was sustained till 2030, we're still arriving there 1.5 million homes short. Wow. And then, you know, so when you look at that and you say, well, if you look at the numbers of, of who it is that needs housing, 67% um, of the people fit the tiny home demographic. So that's singles, couples, um, you know, single parent or young families, um, seniors uh, that are empty nesters, 67% of the, the housing need fits that. So that means 67% of the people of, of that 1.45 million people could live in a tiny home. So that's a million homes. Yes. So yes. that's still a million homes in, in six years. Like we just don't have any way of addressing that. So No, no we don't. So what what we're doing is we're we're um, this this fall and winter we're going to test a a, a pop up factory model. So this is basically a factory that we can plan to move into a location where we have approval and we're working with a municipality to or a city or town to build a community. We'll move the factory and, and within two weeks of it arriving, we'll be able to begin manufacturing tiny homes there. Um, and so this will allow us to train the workforce to um, to our building, uh, our, the way we're building uh, the homes, and we'll be able to set up for a factory if the location is large enough to warrant a, a factory to produce locally. Mm. Um, and the idea is that, you know, if we can get a factory in, a pop-up factory in, begin producing, then once we have permanent manufacturing there, that pop-up factory can move to the next location and do the same thing there. Because yes. that's the only way I can see that we have any chance of, of you know, really addressing a portion of that million people. Yes, definitely. So in addition to um, the, based on your research and your conversations uh, and meetings uh, in at different levels of uh, uh, stakeholders and uh, involved in, in the process. It, in addition to the supply problem, what is the number one bottleneck uh, and uh, that you will address? Uh, and also, what is your proposal uh, to to fix it? Um, well, biggest thing, well, for us has been or now it would be uh, financing. Um, we, I reached out to every municipality in Ontario this year, beginning of the year, and said, hey, you know, we had done a proposal for Huntsville, 
And I had said, I said to everybody, listen, you know, here's our proposal for Hensville. We can do something like this for you. And I said, do you have surplus land that we could partner to develop affordable housing on? Um, so out of that, we, I did about 150 um, Zoom meetings this year. That got narrowed down to uh, about 40 locations that said, yes, we're really interested and we think we have some property. And then out of that, we're down to 24 now that have said, yes, we have this piece of property. So they have identified property that they own that we could develop. Um, so, so, you know, we were able to address the, uh, or at least in these locations, address the land issue. Um, we've um, downloaded the rezoning to uh, the city or town as their responsibility in this partnership arrangement. So the uh, so our next issue is is funding. So we're a nonprofit, um, and that allows us to access some things um, easier than for profit. But then it also makes it more difficult for us because we're trying to do this without bringing in um, investment that's looking for sort of traditional housing returns, right, on, on their investment money. Um, so we're we're working to um, have some social funding as well um, through community bonds is something we're working now with a new organization tapestry to um, to help us raise um, community bonds and we have some other funding initiatives that we're doing outside of the working with the government and we're also um, I was at a housing symposium a couple of weeks ago in Leeds and Grenville and <clears throat> was surprised to find out that Infrastructure Ontario also does some funding of, will fund some um, uh, things along the lines of affordable housing. So we're now exploring that with uh, a couple of the um, cities and, and towns that we partnered with to see if we can access funding there. Because really that's where we're, we're that's our, our big thing now. I mean, building a community is an expensive endeavor. You know, we're we're talking quite a bit of money, and uh, traditional financing is. You know, I can't go into a bank and say, "Hey, loan me thirty million, and I want to build this development here." And they say, kind of like, "Well, who are you? You know, what are you doing? What are these tiny what's? You know, so <laughs> so we have to work around that. And and but mind you, once we established this i mean we're talking with cmhc about applying for funding for some of the northern developments um they're they're interested in it um and there's lots of other things so that's that's the next thing we're, we're tackling that's that's uh, and then uh financing uh sustaining that financial uh responsibility, uh, whether as a corporation, nonprofit, or as an individual homeowner, uh, future homeowner, is also a challenge for uh, for traditional models. And that's why, as we see in the current economy, the, the way things are going, even people who are, at some point, they thought they can afford their mortgages, and now they, 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 they are up, out for a surprise. That it's difficult to sustain the monthly payments, uh, the way things are going now, and, and the cycle will continue even if things will become better. Then a few years later, another cycle comes again. This bottleneck will be there. So there has to be a better financial models uh, that, as you mentioned, that should uh, support this. Now, for for some people who may not know the detail of uh, uh, more detail about uh, uh, tiny towns, if you give a quick rundown of what is the model like, and, and if individuals want to be part of it, like self finance it. Let's say there is like you have 20 uh, units in, in one community or 20 tiny homes in one community. And if 20 people come together to uh, to become bring their own financing, would that be something work? And, and how would it look like for them? Um, well, um, I could see that that being a challenge, especially if they want to do it on their own. Um, you know, uh, zoning probably is the first challenge you're going to face. Um, because, you know, our, our, the, the, oh, how can I put this? So our provincial policy, right, determines how the sort of province de de develops, how it grows. Um, yes. 
it is it was made a number of years ago and it's really focused on developing the urban centers okay so rather than you know everybody talks about sprawl and they want to avoid that um so the you know the focus is on building up in the urban centers so when like this is a um when you want to develop a community in a rural setting there's obstacles that you're going to be faced with so that's like the very first thing um <clears throat> there are um unincorporated townships they offer the easiest way to to develop a community most of those are much much north or quite a bit northern however so you know um as long as you don't mind the relocating to a, a more northern area that would probably be the easiest road to take i've talked to a few people that have started communities in that in that case in that way um so so that's going to be the first challenge is is getting approval for multiple uh units on a property um and then after that it's not so bad because you can design a tiny home um, that meets building code, so that's not that's not not a real obstacle. You know, you still have to to take into account how you're going to deal with the big things are are waste and water. You know, how is that going to be handled? Um, because, um, <clears throat> I mean, we're again, our planning and zoning people are very used to the traditional way of of doing that. So that's septics and wells, right? Um, so when you bring together a number of uh, houses, even tiny houses on a property, the question becomes, well, how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to have one septic system that everybody hooks into, one well that everybody draws water from? And then it's like, okay, well, how is that going to affect everything, right? So how's that going to affect the rest of the water table? Um, or is that going to, you know, um, if you have a communal waste system, how's that going to affect like, um, well, first of all, the groundwater, who's going to manage it if um, in the future, um, it's it's a complicated thing. Uh, Frontenac Township is, is really moving ahead on the communal uh, waste and water systems. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's exciting to see where they're going to head with that because they could they're basically setting a precedent for how other rural um, communities could um, incorporate and support communal systems. So that really opens up has a potential to open up um, uh, s tiny towns or other uh, small communities that are that aren't hooked up to services. Um, right. right. Uh, in in your um, examples and and uh, illustrations that um, I remember when we saw at uh, tiny home show, you, I, I believe uh, you were mentioning the, the the combination of having a rental uh, affordable rental stock and also o o affordable home ownership uh, in your model. Is, is that something that is uh, still in the plan uh, for for the upcoming project? Uh, yes, we. Um, we're shooting for a minimum of 30% of the housing in the development to be affordable rentals. Um, and then that would leave the, um, and then, a, a probably around, um, another 20% maybe as far as, uh, rent to own affordable rent to own housing. And then the balance would be affordable to, to purchase housing. Now in our model, um, we plan that it will be a, a cooperative community. Mm -hmm. So even though we say affordable to purchase, it's it's not like a traditional, you know, go out and buy a house um, mm -hmm. model. You can basically, you, you're buying a share in the cooperative. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the ability to live in that house as long as you want. Um, same as if you bought a house. The big difference is is in the in the in the purchase and the sale so you can't turn around and, and say well i'm moving to i'm moving to bc you know uh, i'm going to sell my house uh, all you can do is the cooperative will buy in in our model the cooperative will buy your house back from you they will pay you um 
what you paid for it plus inflation. So we modeled this so that uh, you, you're not going to appreciate the same as if you bought a, a, a traditionally built house, yes. but your, your equity isn't going to be eroded because of inflation. So the idea is that you can buy the same number of loaves of bread today as you could in the future, assuming the bread follows inflation as well. But, you know, that's the idea. <clears throat> and so this way we can keep things affordable for future generations too. We don't want to just, you know, create a, a, a fix for today and then 10 years down the road be in this situation again in, in these homes. We want to try and set up the model so it's it works in the future as well. So, you know, our, our rentals are planned to be affordable um, by <clears throat> two people making, well, one person making above or two people making minimum wage and same thing for our, our, our uh, purchase model um, that you could carry it to people making just above minimum wage would be able to afford um, uh, a tiny home in the community. And our target is that they're not spending more than 30% of their income. Yeah, that, 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 that will be, that will be amazing. In, in, I mean, we mentioned about rural areas and, and, and the communities and the municipalities that have offered uh, access to surplus land that they have. But in, in the context of more closer to major urban centers, and because some people, I know the affordability is very important, but at the same time, uh, commuting to place of uh, work and employment and other things. Uh, what is, what is, the chance and possibility to have uh, tiny towns uh, within, let's say, proximity of an hour to major cities. Uh, uh, that that still will be a commute, but it still is a, almost doable for 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 a lot of people. But I can, uh, but then then they can still have a way to uh, pay much less in owning, but maybe still be comparing to a rural area. I'm sure at higher cost. But is it possible? Is it doable based on your uh, research so far? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, when 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 I started, I looked at all the, you know, cities and towns in Ontario, and, or actually even Canada, and figured that, you know, there is land available within, like you say, an hour or less commute of of a of a each center. Um, the the challenge is just getting the model designed, built, so that people can. <clears throat> pardon me. So that people can see it. I mean, that's the biggest challenge here is, you know, have these nice pictures we make and, and, you know, design ideas. And, and in my mind, I see people living in these developments, right? It's not, you know, I see them as, as flourishing. Um, but the thing is, I've been eating, breathing, sleeping it for, for, you know, five years now. Um, and other people haven't. And, and what we need is really to be able to show people how the, the some first showcase communities built so we can bring those uh, decision makers to it, you know, whether it's councils or, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, the um, people in planning and, and, and building departments come see these and see that, hey, these are beautiful neighborhoods of small houses. And then I really think that we're going to see a lot more interest because, you know, anything like if we look at, at this as an example, this is our, our one of our proposals for Elliot Lake. So here we're proposing to put, uh, I think it's 80 homes in this piece of property. So this is in town on, on municipal services. Um, it's just under a seven acre lot there. And you know we can we can basically have this up and running within two years of start, and that's really hard for something else to do in a different form of housing. So you know I think that once we have this model up and running, and we can invite people to it and say, hey, let's build one of these in your neighborhood, you know, within commute of wherever. I I really think people are gonna the decision makers are gonna see the benefit and and want it add this to the housing stock yes yes and we, we need more more uh, support from the decision makers on different levels uh, because if we wait for the traditional models it's not gonna uh, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation it's not we cannot keep up with the with the 
way things are going and the way that how behind we are uh, and also uh, for for individuals uh, who are, whether they are uh, renting or renting rent to own or owning it uh, uh, up front uh, we, we every community will flourish when there's a sense of hope and belonging and sense of uh, stability and 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 more than anything else uh, other than having a basic shelter we we need to give uh, especially the future generation, a sense of hope for the future, a sense of possibilities, right? A, a, a sense of uh, that we belong to the future. We don't. We, we, that's not that something is all cut off. Or that we don't hit a wall. Uh, and and I believe that that's one of the ways to sustain our social and business resilience going forward. To build values like this in you know within our communities, whether it's from the backyard as you mentioned at the beginning, or within a pocket of the neighborhood, the tiny town homes within the commute, or 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 as as close as possible to to other uh, infrastructures. Because if we don't give hope then uh, to our generation that are coming, uh, we we will we will. Uh, not be sustaining anything that we have so far. I think, you know, what What a lot of people have not really given a lot of thought to is the fact that we haven't planned a route for people, new people to get into housing, right? There isn't, there isn't really any more of a staged um, path into traditional housing. I mean, to go from renting into a 600 or 800 or a million dollar home is a big jump right it is and you know so we don't have any of those any of that interim housing so this is what i'm hoping that that this will be able to provide it'll be able to be a stepping stone into more traditional housing both stepping stone into and out of because that's another thing that we lack so much of is I've talked to so many municipalities and they say, you know, our seniors have nowhere to downsize into. So yes. that has that has real implications because if seniors one or two are living in their family home because they don't have any other option, they're also keeping that family home off the market where a family could move into. So, yes. you know, you know, by we we need this we need something like this and and i don't say this is the only solution but i think it's a good help for the solution you know is this can be a, a place people can move into traditional housing and then when their uh their family is back down to one or two people they can move out of this and free up that family home so basically you know address the whole housing needs um in by just building more of these Yes, and and your your uh, vision and the way you are looking at it is uh, makes it more sustainable, and not necessarily for only for environmental or material, but in also to functionally and practically for different generations and different stages of our life to uh, to have a circle of sustainability in like you said how things. For example, the aging in place for seniors, right? So, or they 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 are forced to age in place in their big home now, where they, they say they can't find a smaller place to. The downsize, uh, uh, and then also, if we have the smaller place downside, we 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 don't need to have a lot of uh, uh, pressure on um, senior home communities, right? In terms of like a senior living or assisted living, that because if these these communities are uh, interconnected and they are small pockets, uh, there will be a sense of uh, support and connection, like a small village, like a tiny village, right? Yes. Uh, a tiny town and tiny village. Uh, and then, um, then we will lessen uh, pressure on the infrastructure. As uh, we we saw how how difficult uh, the impact of COVID was in our on our seniors, uh, where they were they and they they were the one the most affected by the disaster of uh, pandemic, and this will uh, offset future. Uh, 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 challenges that might happen it will make the communities more resilient if they they, they they make this more possible whether they are small towns or neighborhoods uh, communities or or the big big urban centers uh, we hope that as we continue these conversations in the future we will hear more positive good news uh, of support and progress and actual uh, examples uh, taken in place uh, uh, so that more communities more municipalities will take uh, 
take the initiative to replicate these uh, these concepts uh, because the, the more we do the more we need this it's, it, it, it's not that we only do a, a, a couple of neighborhoods and you're done with this concept yes this is what i why i'm so interested in sharing everything that we we develop and we find is because the only way we have a chance of of addressing some of this is if there are many people working together. So yes, yeah, and we are we are happy to have you uh, it, uh, with us uh, in this conversation. We are we're, we're, uh, looking forward to have you uh, in Canadian Business Owner Magazine and the Business of Real Estate section to feature you and to have uh, a more uh, insight and update about the progress of Tiny Towns Associations in the future uh, as well. We will continue these conversations and uh, we let's work together and uh, we invite all the listeners and audience who are we watching, listening uh, to, uh, to this conversation or reading through the magazine afterward uh, to uh, to be part of this and, and support uh, the, these initiatives that, uh, that make things sustainable for all of us instead of uh, we, will, uh, we want to make make the the world a better place for all of us and our world our neighborhood start with one tiny uh, town at a time one tiny town at a time that's right yeah uh, Thanks very for nice uh, talking to you uh, we will continue the conversation in the future thank you